Joe Senior, Joe Kelly, uh, one of our uh, town's long-standing community um, uh, leaders, uh, business uh, people, and commonly and um, wonderfully known around the town as a, a person who has an intrinsic knowledge of where we've all come out of, and uh, a, a deep history and love, of course, of the town and the town centre as people. Kelly family have been linked to the town as long as I'd say most of our life readers uh, can remember. And we now have the fifth generation of Kellys living here in Society Street. Describe a little of the background of what you used to do five generations ago in Society Street and where you lived. Well, on my father's side, he was born here in Society Street at the back of the Presbyterian Church. As you go up the steps there, there was a two bedroom cottage that his mother and father were caretakers for the Presbyterian Church authorities and so that's it. my father was born there my mother was born in the Cladding Galway and moved to St Michael's Square and that's where the story started other members of the Kelly family I think most of them worked in the hospitals around the area which was the big employer like psychiatric nurses and things like that Mm -hmm. But my grandfather worked as a caretaker of the Presbyterian Church and as a gardener around the town in general. And he worked for Jack Fallon in the egg and wool store and the stables. And he used to work in Andrew Jennings's bear, bottling the Guinness and capping it. And I often helped him doing that. I can still remember the very strong smell that it nearly turned your stomach at the time when you'd be a kid. You, you have to explain this, Joe, out to our younger readers. At the time, Guinness came in Firkins, in Firkins on the, yeah. on the ca canal. Huge, and the yeah. publican bought a Firkin, Firkin and then that's right, yeah. And actually, my father's later job, my own father's job later on, was delivering them Firkins and delivering barrels around the whole of East Galway and Manislaw. And go back now, how many, there was a, a term called a hogshead of porter, do you remember that? I, rem I, re I remember the, the measures. The, the, I remember being mentioned, but I wouldn't be able to tell you what it is now. It <laughs> yeah. was sweet stuff. Yeah. And of course, again, people forget, for nearly 140 years, every pint of porter that was sold to the west of Ireland had to pass through the Banana Slope Canal That's basin. Right. That's Had your family any involvement with the canals? Well, my father, my father worked down in the canal basin, taking off the barrels that came down from on the barges and delivering them around with Banda Slough and East Galway. Himself and Mr. Rankin in Brackenia yeah, and Billy Vahan and people like that, they all worked down there. Joe Scarry, the Rileys, Johnny Riley, they all worked down there. I used to... I had often on my way to school to drop my father's lunch in on my way down to school and to be all in there, all the lads, and to be tasting the product. <laughs> <laughs> and this would be at nine o'clock in the morning. Nine o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so, Very continental. Yeah. You, again, younger viewers or younger uh, readers might not be aware the town of Banlaslow, since Lancarty laid it out, was predominantly a Church of Ireland town, but there was a significant Presbyterian community in it. They had their own church. Yeah. Um, so the town in the 30s and 40s, the business people wouldn't have all been going to St. Michael's. No, that's for certain. That's for certain. The Presbyterian church was very busy because we used to have, I, my grandfather and grandmother used to clean it. And when I was a kid, I used to often go in and help them. I'd be knocking around and I'd try to be helping them out, like, you know. Often got the price of the pictures for doing it, like. <laughs> you had to get paid for everything that time, you know. But everybody had a job that time, you know. There was no such thing as waiting until you qualified with your education. How much, how much, how much would it have cost to get into the pictures? Was that the plaza or was that the Ashton? That was the, was no, the, it was uh, the... The Central Cinema. The Central Cinema. Central Cinema, now Utah, right? <laughs> yeah. And the Town Hall. Right. And the, the run was, you go down to the pictures, you'd look at the two features on the window and you'd decide which hall you were going to that night. But the one thing that was constant and all that, you had to have the price of a bag of chips and melted theories as well, or it didn't feel like going to the pictures <laughs> at all. And what movies can you remember be between your communion and your confirmation? What were the big hits uh, that you used to well, flock to? John Wayne seemed to be on every weekend in, 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 in town. <laughs> 
match it with a rugby weekend, you know. The Duke. That is and I believe, even though it was, I think it was, I think it was made, I think around the time I was born, 1952, I believe the queues to see the white man were unprecedented in town. Huge crowds all down along the street was on the Central Cinema. Actually, my good friend and neighbour next door, Martin Ryan, just tell great stories about all that time. That's where I learned most of what I know about that era, you know, from and from my own bits of memory. But Martin Ryan would be the man that has. There's always great, always was always great stories told in Ryan's like. Was Ryan's was a long time in town now too, a lot longer than me, in the pub trade, and you know they had a lot more stories like you know. And youngsters growing up in town in the late fifties or mid fifties and early sixties, was it a vibrant town? Was there always development to be done? Or? Always different to be done, and and but very vibrant and ter very community based. Like the happiest times, I suppose, when I was a kid, my mum died like at thirty four years of age, like, and it, when it's a traumatic event, like, and I, my younger sister and my younger brother Michael and my sister Lily, and of course we were kind of. I didn't know because the f my father had to be working and then he was working away as well so but uh, Fernands stepped up to the plate my aunt Teresa and her husband Oliver and they had three children of their own David, Marie and Anne mm -hmm. and they, they took us in and reared us and it was a real happy time for us there at that stage you know that really made us feel very welcome I suppose that was common for the Ireland of the time. If if a young oh, mother or father died early, yeah. some members of the family took in the the, yeah. the, the the remaining kids to help them through their, their schooling and to make sure they had three square meals a day. One one of the strongest memories at that time was how how good the community was. My man worked in Doberry Shoe Factory, and they actually the morning she died, they arrived in mass at the door, mm. and they took over the whole arrangements of the funeral. Discussing uh, with me um, the um, kinship that the Dewberry employees had for each other and how wonderful the workforce were at the time of your mum's uh, de death. The, 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 the foundation of Dewberry and its role as employer in town in the 40s and 50s, will you just give us your understanding of that? My understanding was that the Scott family arrived in town. I don't know who was on the councils here at the time, but it was a planned object to get the factory, show factory open in town. Scots brought a lot of expertise with them from, I think it was Leicester, right. which was a big show area in England, in the UK. And they brought the people that knew the show trade, the Boswells, the Argents, and all these people, and, the, and, and they got the best of the people around the town. And it was a fabulous employer for, for all the years, and it's still operational today. I had a couple of stints in it myself, and the wages were always very good in it, and you'd meet some the best people in, in Ireland in it. But I always believed that Mr. Scott, Jim, big Jim Scott himself, I was always very disappointed there wasn't a plaque put up in his honour over at the site where the original Lowberry was, like, because... Which was the old workhouse. It was the old workhouse, and it actually... During the 50s and 60s, it kept this town afloat, along with Mr. Billy O'Carroll and the hotel. Huge employers as well, like, huge employers of the local population on the ground, you know, and, uh, which was important because it kept the town vibrant, because there was money in and around the town that staged in, so it was great. So they're the two men that I take, and of course the Cullens in as well, the Cullen family were, had a big... A uh, drapery shop in town here, and once, once you got a job in Dubarry, you could go into Cullen's and get a book, and buy whatever clothes you wanted, shoes and that. We all wanted to be like Elvis Presley and Dicky Rock at the time, and all these lads. And <coughs> you get your book. Once you once you're in Dubarry, you got your book, and you could go in every Friday when you got paid and pay whatever off two shillings or a shilling or a half a crown or whatever it was off your bill, like. But we were always pig dressed at the time, <laughs> so it was great. Like, you'd, be buying, you'd be buying new clothes every week to go to the dances on a Sunday night in the Emerald Ballroom. Oh, yeah. Which was great, too. Like, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Outlet for us. Um, Joe Kelly and schooling. You were educated in St. Grellens, I'd say, were you? Yeah. St. Grellens, I, I, school you remember wasn't some of your funny teachers or funny school, moments? School, there. school wasn't one of my strong suits now, to be honest. All right. I um, Now, I was very lucky as it was. The thing I remember most about school as it was is Matty Gantley bringing us out at the lunchtime to play football in the green league. And that was, football was, I was mad into football always, like, and at that time, you know. And Matty would be encouraging us, like, you know. But all the way up through, all the way up along, I, um, I didn't learn, I just, I was only, uh, I was kind of a lad that just about done enough just to get by, like. Never overdone, never overtaxed myself or anything, like. But, uh, until I went, the last year I was in school, when I was in seventh class before I left school, the last year, I went into the principal, who was Pat Kearney, Patrick Kearney, who be Carmel Kearney's father, who started a girl school in town here. Now, so he, had a, he had a fearsome reputation, <coughs> I have to say this, he had a fearsome reputation, and we were all nervous going into him, and because you'd be hearing the stories of the lads that were in classes before you, like, and they'd have the hair standing on the back of your neck. But <laughs> for some reason or another, he took a shine to me, and he was, I, I always remember how kind he was to me. I don't know what the reason was, but he always treated me well, and I learned an extra bit there with him in the last year I was in school. So he got, I suppose, anything that was in me, he got out of me, like. And apart from the football, which was big in town in the 50s and 60s, what other hobbies would young men of your age, as teenagers, had? Well, was there billiards? Was there... Yes, we had the social club, of course, right. and the, the workmen's club, and the hut. You know, now it was hard to get into them if you were a kid, like, but yeah. if you were lucky enough to get into them, you'd be mixing with all the, the older people, and you thought you were great, like. Mm. The workmen's club was over the town hall. The hut was where the men's toilets are above, and then you had the social club over the middle ballroom, you know. Which was and we had there was a vice club there as well. That we used to go into before you go into the vice club and try and work your way into the social club, then the bigger one. But John Madden was the steward of the club, a gentleman as well. And that'd be John Madden in Brackenya. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Desi is still living up there and he's Desi's brother Ronnie is a priest. He was on, he was out in the worked in, priest in the army there for years in the mm -hmm. clubs anyways were you know, I, but you were always anxious to get into the social club because there was great card games in it and you had great characters in it as well mm -hmm. Johnny Riddle Mickey Murray Mr Price at the time and Father Brown and they'd be if you, they'd be always stuck for one or two to play a game of cards and they'd, and if, if you were there even though you might be a bit young they'd let you in and they'd, try, they'd be telling you how to play the cards, they'd be teaching you the games of cards, the different games, you know. Whist. It was great. Yeah. Poker, really very, yeah. really. poker mostly, you know. <coughs> oh, poker. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Serge played poker and, as well. Uh, yeah. yeah. And just in terms of sports, soccer would have taken hold in town in the 50s. Yeah. Swimming had a, had a significant club. There was other... Soccer didn't actually take hold. It was formed in the it's 50s, all right, uh, soccer club in the 50s. I think it was, I don't know, it was 53 or 54 or that yeah. Yeah. And um, but I have a huge affiliation with both the soccer club and the G and the GA club in town, like. And uh, they were always the two loves of my life, like. Mm -hmm. And I um, I remember soccer being played in the fair green. Bobby Welsh mm -hmm. was involved in the, Billy Vaughan, Johnny Riddle, Mickey Murray. I remember all them lads playing before I started playing. And then I was chairman then of the soccer club and we had a few notable achievements. We brought Birmingham City, Gillingham and Dundee to town to play a challenge, to play friendly matches. Mm -hmm. And we brought Galway United, the year Galway United won the FAI Cup, the only time they won it. We brought them to town to play them. We were very vibrant at the time. We had some great teams in the club at the time, you know, throughout mm -hmm. the years, you know. So uh, a bit, of, I suppose the unique thing about it is that I, I, I ended up at different stages, which I don't know, it, would be, it wouldn't be the done thing anywhere, I think. I ended up being chairman of the soccer club 
And then at another time, being chairman of the GA club, which was unusual, to say the least, like, you know. But would, it, would it be fair to suggest that it was a fairly ecumenical sporting town, that the fellas followed a bit of soccer, they played a bit of football in the summer, they, they moved around their allegiances? Well, depending. this was yeah, this was after the ban. After the ban, yeah. After the yeah. ban. I remember getting banned myself on time for playing soccer out in the, out in the Fair Green. The Fair Green. At that time it was hard to get into Dugan Plough to play football. But back in the day, when the street leagues were on, it was a great time. Street leagues were a huge thing, like. Hmm. Patsy Garrity, Lily Broderick, Mike Day, they organised these street leagues in the town. And there were, I often I often seen six and seven hundred up at a street league match in the Dugan Park, you know, but it was a semi. So, I suppose, looking well, back... Well, wasn't there a cricket club, there was a cricket club in the in the hut. All right. There was, a, there was a cricket club in the hut, like, after the war. Right. You know, when the like, servicemen came back from the war here to town, some of them must bring back the bat and the... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there were, for years, up until, not long before it, it closed, all the apparatus for organising cricket matches was in the hut, in, the hut. in a box in the hut, and used to be taken out once in a blue moon back in the day, and to be a game of cricket played in there. Yeah. Was there much, I'm just wondering, I've heard a lot of stories about the hut and the activities and the men that, that, that took part in it. Growing up as a young fellow of 10 or 12 years of age, did you have any great understanding of what those veterans did or why they, they joined the... the, 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 the Campaigns in thirty nine and in nineteen sixteen or nineteen fifteen, or was there much talk about? Not really. There wasn't a whole lot of talk because there were army pensions, army, yeah. or you know, there wouldn't have been a whole lot of talk because I suppose the the mental state of what a lot of people would have seen in wars, like there wouldn't be things that they want to be talking yeah. about, you know, particularly in front of young people, sure. you know. Yeah. It's just that that lovely book came out by the Battle of Slow Heritage. Oh, I did. Yeah, I enjoyed that. Actually, and, you know, enjoyed that, yeah. We were a big town yeah, for recruitment, and we, you know, it, yeah. it, the British Army for 120 years in the West of Ireland yeah. was the false yeah. game. Yeah. If you couldn't do yeah. anything else, and you had a wife and kids yeah. to feed, you you joined the, the colours. That you, know? you mentioned the false game. Now the very first anchor, which was the, I think it was the funk, the, the cleaning of all the windows in St Bridget's Hospital. Every oh. one of them, yeah. I was the foreman on that job. Really? Yeah, I was, yeah. Anko was 79. I was at 79, was it? I can't remember. I know it for dates at all. 79 or 80, I think. I had a crew <coughs> jockers with me there, and that was the job we got. I'll talk to you about that Maureen, in a minute now. Maureen Hines was the organiser of it. All right. So, <coughs> when you left school, what was your first job? Uh, when I left school, uh, when I left school, My first, I went to I went to Dublin for about ten years working for an aunt of mine who had a shop, a corner shop in Cavan Tilly, Hardy's corner shop in Cavan Tilly, and that that I explained to my children and grandchildren that's where I went to school. That was the University of Life. The Dubs, Dublin. the Dubs yeah. given the university education. After six months, the roof edges were gone off me, and I was a new boy, a new man. I went up very raw. So this would have been mid sixties. Mid sixties. The swinging yeah, sixties yeah. of swinging the Dublin. 60s, yeah. oh, teddy boys yeah, and all that. Yeah. yeah. And used, was, used to go down to a place called the Porty Kitchen, down Don Leary, to hear folk bands at the time, right. and it used to dance in the top hat in Don Leary, and the Royal Sterlite Hotel in Brea. So I was wild, I suppose you could say. Ah, now hold on a second, I might be that wild. Um, but that so that would be Dublin on the move, Dublin yeah. the, the the year the, the post Lamass yeah. Mass moving into yeah. uh, Lynch. Lots of money in Dublin, lots oh, of building, yeah. lots of new fashion and new cars and people buying houses and stuff. You know, Bill Cullen wrote about it very well yeah. in, in the Penny Apples. The, the, the area I lived in in Cabin Tilly in Dublin, very affluent area. Mm -hmm. All around the Hort and all that area, Fox Rock and all that. It was very Huge money there all always still and still is. Yeah. And and I love going back there to meet my cousins and, and stay with them for a few I absolutely love going up to see them because they're so all kind to me when I go up and all and we have I meet some of the people that I knew when I worked there, like there isn't a whole lot of them left now, but I meet a few of them like, you know. And again for younger people, the hours of business trading back then in the mid sixties, they were much longer than now. You well, didn't nice more than forty hours a week. When I started working in Dublin, I worked seven days a week, 
seven days a week from seven o'clock in the morning until seven o'clock in the evening every single day of the week and did you get your din dinner hour did you i got my dinner hour but the, the wages i got were eight pound a week all found and the all found was what you work for like really <laughs> The all found was worth more than the air pound. Like you, you, you get, you had a good bed. The place was warm, clean. You got plenty of food, and maybe every six or seven weeks you'd be bought some clothes and that's like. So the all found was brilliant in Dublin. <laughs> yeah. Had you a motor car at this time? No motor car. Did you motor car? Had you a bicycle? No bicycle. No motor car. You no, no bike? No, no bicycle. No motor car. Nothing like that. No. Huh? no. <clears throat> and when did you buy your first car? I first, yeah. I bought my first car off Declan Bannerton because I was, I was an awful man for jumping around from one job to another, and I wanted to work for myself. So I, I wanted to go into the contract cleaning business, which I did. Like, but wait, now, you're ten years ago in Dublin. Did you come back to Bandeslaw then? Came back to Bandeslaw, yeah. To a job, yeah, or yeah. just to come back to? I came back to Bandeslaw. When I came back to Bandeslaw, the first job I got was kitchen porter in St Bridget's. Patsy Gerrity got me. I went down on the Friday to him down to his house mm -hmm. and I asked him would he be able to get me a job because Patsy was the man around that got, got you whatever you know yeah. so I asked him would he be able to get me a job that I was after coming back from Dublin and that I was married and I, was just, I came back home to get married and I went back to Dublin for a year or two and then came back home mm -hmm. so I went down at lunchtime on a Friday and he came up to me in the evening and he said to me be out in St Bridges Hospital kitchen at 8 o'clock Monday morning have a job in the kitchen, kitchen porter, and I had a few great years there, very happy memories. So um, back, did, you, you, you got engaged and you romanced from Dublin, uh, all found. Oh yeah, it was a long distance, it was a <laughs> long distance romance. Yeah. Had you known the girl before you oh, left I did, from yeah, the city? I knew the family, nice. I, I knew my wife Irene before. We had worked around in Dubarry a bit before, before I left, you know. I had to spend a little short time in Dubarry and that. And I'd known so her, you met her in Dubarry? I'd known her, yeah, and I'd known her family, like, you know. And, right. that, and her family would have been great anyways, like. So, it was by chance we got together, like. It was just kind of by chance. Did the Emerald Ballroom play a role? I did, actually. We danced in the Emerald Ballroom, yeah. <laughs> at a time when, it, at a time when it'd be, it'd be absolutely thronged, like, thronged. Fred Jennings and Fred Kelly Jennings, Jennings, yeah, be on the door, on the door yeah. 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 And we, when we'd be coming home from the pictures, this is before I got started going out, when I was hanging around with the lads, like, my mates, mm -hmm. we'd, the pictures would be over around quarter to 11 or 11 o'clock, and straight up to the Merle Ballroom, stand outside the door then for the next half hour, 45 minutes, waiting for some couple to come out that was going home early, and they give you the tickets on the way out, and you would go in with them tickets then, that's the way it worked. And Fred and Ken never and, objected? Uh, well, no, they, there was one or two people there, all right, they'd be watching you and they'd stop you. But, but uh, Mr. Jennings would always let you in, you know. And we, used, we actually, there's a, actually, there's a door on top of the Emerald Ballroom. We often climbed up to the top of the Emerald Ballroom, outside, and got in that door to go out to the dances. Yeah. <laughs> so, in 1972, Joe? Yeah. Where, what church did you use? Or? St. Michael's. It was a double wedding. Oh, lovely. Myself, my wife Irene, and her brother Paul, and his wife Maura Larkin from Ockham. So it was a double wedding. The reception was held in the Edens Hotel. And our honeymoon was spent in Galway, in Air Square, in the, what is the name of the hotel in Air Square? Great Northern? Southern. No. Merrick. Well, the, the Imperial. 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 Yeah. That's where our honeymoon was spent, you know. I think, we, I think we had enough money for three nights in there or something like that. So <laughs> that's the way it worked that time, you know. So, so you're a young married man, you've come back from Dublin, Patsy got you the, the job as a yeah. kitchen porter, and then you started doing a bit of nixing, you did a bit of nighttime work, and you started to get involved yeah. in security. Security, yeah. Were you still playing football at this time? Or I, was playing a bit of football. I was playing a bit of football. I, I stopped playing football as a young, young enough man, like, you know, and soccer. Right. But I was playing a bit of football, you know, but I was. I went from playing to getting heavily involved on the management, on the right. management side and on the organisations of course, yeah. and that type of thing. So that's what I was at mostly, like, you know, but worked in the Shamrock Bear. I started, my pub life started in the Shamrock Bear, which was owned at the time by Pierce Courtney. And eventually then he turned it into the East County Hotel. 
So there was a ballroom at the back of it, and that's where the first disco in Bandeslaw was, the back of these county hotel, back of the Shamrock Bear. The, the, the old sod, sod. The old sod, yeah. yeah. That's where the first disco in town was. So when John Travolta's fever took to the, to the East Gallery town, it was in the back we of the bit, Shamrock. We were a bit before that now, we were a bit before John Travolta <laughs> actually, you know. <laughs> Yeah. So you were in there as a bar superintendent or I was, did you work? I started off as a bear man right. and then I think because of my size and maybe, I don't know was it my reputation or whatever my size but I was put out onto the door anyways. So you'd be jumping from the door to the bear like you know depending on where the hot spot was like you'd be jumping you know so that's the way it was. And again some people the the town for the, I suppose the 60s and the 70s and the 80s was renowned for a place of entertainment. The, the Emerald Ballroom in the late mid 60s to the early 70s was a mecca. And then the different hotels and different hostelries in town, the Log Cabin, the Muscle Lid on it, the um, Shamrock and, and the uh, East County Hotel uh, moved in it. It was a huge place uh, for Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night revelry. Just describe a little bit the, the numbers of crowds and the people that would turn up to stuff. Well, uh, it, it was that busy in town at that period that I remember coming down to work in the Shamrock Bear at the East County Hotel and you get it hair to walk up and down Dunross Street. You get it hair to walk, you'd have to be turning sideways so you wouldn't be bumping into people in the street. But then you had Hayden's Hotel there which would draw savage crowds to the hotel and to the street. And there was always some function in Hayden's, a dinner dance or some function or other. So. Wedding. Weddings. So. They were doing an average yeah. four a week. Yeah. Back in the heyday. <laughs> and I worked in Hayden's for a while as well, actually. For Mr. Oh, did you? I did, yeah. I did. Yeah. And you were telling me that you you got involved in some of the early. Um, you mentioned in Dunleary going to a folk club, so your your love yeah. of tra tra traditional music, ballad singing, yeah. and folk probably started then. But you and your brother Mike were involved in running a folk club in River Street. No, I wasn't actually involved in the fo oh, folk sorry. club in River Street. It was Michael. Okay. So I only found this out actually fairly recently myself, because I had always a big, I had a big hand in booking a lot of huge bands here in town like Daniel O'Donnell and people like that, all down through the years when I was in the Lyrgis Country Hotel, mm -hmm. which was East County, like changing names. After changing Pierce Sol, like, yeah. for the Clare family. So I had a big, I had a, that was my job. My job was organising the discos and organising the big bands. So the biggest booked. artist you booked, who might that have been? The biggest artist I booked, personally, was Daniel O'Donnell, because he was the dearest. <laughs> he, he cost. I could have. I could have actually got him in twelve months previous. I could have got him in twelve months previous to when I did book him for eight hundred pound at the time. This was the early nineties. Yeah. Then. And I wouldn't I, because I had never heard of Daniel O'Donnell. I wouldn't. I wouldn't book him. But. I, I had my ear to the ground a lot and I knew I was getting more back that he was starting to do the numbers like. So the next time I tried to get him then, the price was £4,000 on a Thursday night. Or if I wanted him Saturday or Sunday night, it was £5,000. So He was the Mike Denver of his generation. So on a cold Thursday night in Bandeslaw, which would normally be quite anyways like, we had the great Daniel O'Donnell in, giving him £4,000. I remember when we were signing the contract, the boss lady said to me, she said, you know, if this doesn't work out, what happens? You have no job. You know, 4000 like it was a lot of money. And what was the ticket price? The normal ticket price at the time, when we were doing the bands, most of the bands that we'd be doing at the time, would be maybe a five or, or six pound, depending. But because of the price of that, we had to go a bit, you know, so we charged £10 and it was the first time ever we charged ten pound, and every single woman that went into the dance that night absolutely devoured Sean O'Curley and myself for charging the ten pound. But the great thing about it, I was, I wanted to get the numbers. Four hundred was the cut-off point for me to, to, that we'd haven't paid, and that was great. Like you know, we actually let in a thousand people at a tenner ahead. So I think they made about 6,000 on the door that night. So that was the story of that. And the great thing about it was, the leader of the band that time was Billy Burgain, who was a classmate of mine, sat beside me in school, one of the Burgains from Society Street here, where I got my first haircut. 
ever of his father. So we had a bit of a connection there. So he gave me a little backhander for myself at the end of the night, so it was great, like, a bit of a bonus, like. And go back to the Kelly involvement in, book, in U2's first ever gig in West of the Shannon. <laughs> So I, was, so I was bragging about this Daniel O'Donnell thing and all the big acts that I booked in the whole lot. And Michael piped up, my brother, one day and said to me, I'll give you a good one now, he said. He said, do you remember you two playing in town? And I didn't remember it because I was gone to Dublin at the time. I think I was in Dublin, I think, at the time. And I think it was around 79 or 80. Or six, was it 69? So no, 79 or 80. 79 right, or 80. And uh, he said, you two played in Band of Slow, and I was taken aback. I was really, because I thought I knew everything about who played in Band of Slow and music, and I was booking bands left, right and centre, and all big acts. They played in Kenny's River Street. There was a bit of a folk club there at the time. It's now Scruffy Browns. And they and they actually played for the door. What was taken in on the door, they got it like. Was, was, Paul, was, was Paul McGuinness in charge back then? It was their first time <laughs> to play outside Dublin. It was their first gig outside Dublin, you two's first gig. But they made the money over it like. And they're still making the money as it was over it. We were lucky to get a few quid old Daniel O'Donnell as it was. So that's, that's the thing, you know. That's so. Just b before I go, I'll go back into the pub trade, um, you were blessed with, with with a happy family. Did we just mention their names and in the order that the, that, that the good Lord provided them well, all to you? We, we were blessed. We were blessed with five great children, and here is where I want to be saying thanks to Porty Uncle Hospital. It was great to have it on our doorstep always, because just for 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 the children being born and for the little ailments that you have when they be grown up. Or whatever it was always great just to step away from us all the time so it was always great to have poor young there so uh, joanne came along first lied him and then grace and then joseph joby who was now running the pub and then michael all five all five yeah and ten and the, the eleven grandchildren now so bless them all bless them. To, to now, talk to us a little about how you got into the licence trade. So you took a lease, you you, you, you worked the, the East County, the Lerridge's place for about I 15 years. I got the experience working in the East County in the Shamrock Bar and Lerridge's Hotel with... with Just before I do the pub thing, you you mentioned Sean Ogg and yeah. your alliance with Sean Ogg. And for me, growing up in town in the late 80s, there was only two men that were in charge of our, of our sex lives and our love lives, and that was you and Sean Oak at the door of his county, and controlling who was getting in or getting out of the disco uh, back then. And it goes back further than that. Does it? We have a waffle connection. We served mass, we served, we served mass together in Port Uncle Hospital. That time, on a Sunday morning, the mass used to be at half six, and it was hair getting up all right, but if I wasn't getting up for the mass, I'd be... I'd be getting up for the big breakfast you get after serving it, like in the kitchen. You get a big fry and you wouldn't see a fry from one end of the year to another. <laughs> Only for you went into the, the hospital. The fed, fed, fed you well. Fed as well, yeah. We served master for a good few years. George Hurley, Sean and myself. So I advised them. Though Barry was very busy at the time and we were working in this county together and Sean was baking and we used to... And I said to him, would you not try Doe Barry like? And so we... I had a chat about it and so he got in anyways and he's, he was there until he retired then, you know. You, you mentioned the bakeries to me. For, for a lot of people the only bakery was Lynch's and O'Rourke's bakery, but there was other bakeries in town and Sean O'Rourke worked in one of them, didn't he? Sean O'Rourke worked in, in for Christian Shandy, who would, who would be a relation to Sean O'Rourke's like, you know. They worked down the lane where we were at Gibbons's Bar there and there was a blacksmith's down that lane where as well, you know, Jim Higgins. Remember them back in the day as well, you know. But uh, that's that was the connection. I have a connection with them all my life, actually. No, since I was a kid, like you know. So. And your, your I, I just think of the, 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 the bakers. Your brother Mike was a good baker in his day too. He still is baking very strong now at the minute, actually, because of the. Is he causing the run on the flour? He, he's that same. He's causing <laughs> the run on the flour at the minute because he's a great man for baking the cream cakes and the sponge cakes and the brown and white cake bread. And what about and the, olive, the, the, olive, the olive bread? The olive yeah, bread very he has. Very good, he has, I he has He's delivering it around to all the neighbours and the, the friends and anyone that's sick and all, so uh, it's great, like.